It's, it's again, a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I have the great honor of introducing Jeff tonight, and I want to say that, you know, if, if book sales and video views are any indication of what Jeff Speck is, he may be the most listened to city planner in the entire world. <laughs> Suburban Nation, which Jeff had written with Andre Struani and Liz Elizabeth Plater Zyberk, was the best-selling planning title of the 2000s. In fact, the Wall Street Journal called it the Urbanist Bible. His award-winning book, Walkable City, which you all have the 10th anniversary copy of tonight, was published in 2012. It was the dominant planning title of its time in a decade, and it's the second best urban planning book of all time, and it's been f translated into eight different, eight different languages. His 2018 book, Walkable City Rules, 100 Steps to Making Better Places, has already been translated into six languages, and his TED Talks and YouTube videos have been viewed more than six million times. He's formerly the director of the National Endowment for the Arts, and Jeff founded Jeff Speck and Associates, a boutique planning and design firm in 2017. And last year, he celebrated the 10th anniversary of the Walkable City book that I mentioned, Walkable City, with a new edition containing brand new 100 pages and eight new chapters. It's been a delight, really, to spend the afternoon with Jeff and get to know him a little bit better and really to host him for his first visit to Chattanooga. So won't you join me and welcome with a large Chattanooga welcome, Jeff Speck. Hi, everybody. Am I projecting? Great. Wow, thank you. Uh, yeah, this is my first time in Chattanooga, which is really surprising because I've been hearing about Chattanooga for, for decades, uh, especially a lot of my colleagues uh, have been working here. And I've worked in Memphis. I was in Nashville last week, strangely enough. Um, but this is my first time in Chattanooga, and it, it does live up to the hype. So congratulations for that. Um, Many thanks to Eric, to the Chattanooga Design Studio, to the Lindhurst Foundation, and PlayCore, who sponsored this talk. Thanks to all of you for coming. Um, especially thank you for the sponsors for giving you all my book, which makes me really happy. Once every five years or so, I give a talk and they buy books for everyone, but it doesn't happen very often. Um, and you do have the new edition. You have the brand new 10th anniversary edition of the book, which means there's 100 new pages that I just wrote a year ago um, in the back of the book. So I hope you'll enjoy that. Um, the question you may be asking is, what happened to the walkable city guy? <laughs> um, and I keep try trying to come up with good uh, explanations, but I now say I blame Japan. Because I was in Tokyo this summer with my family, and literally it was so damn walkable and we were walking 20,000 steps a day, every day, and that in turning 60, I think, caused me to need <laughs> a cast on my foot. But lest you think my powers are diminished, um, I want to do a quick demonstration here. Voila. <laughs> Sorry, that was too easy. So I have a lot to tell you tonight, um, and uh, I have 400 slides. I'm not kidding, but I go really, I go really fast. I won't keep you too, too long um, over, but um, this, was one of the, this, is, this is my favorite thing that I get to do, which is to get to know a city first in the Google and then in, in person and to try and craft the message that I share all over the place, you know, in, in Tokyo, in, in Nashville, wherever I go, um, but to try and figure out what aspects of that message are relevant to the place I happen to be, and then, as you'll see, to find local examples and to then reach some very brief, not brief, perhaps, but some very um, tentative conclusions about what some next steps might be that would drive your, um, your, the quality of your city forward. You've come so far in the last two decades. I think most of you know that. Uh, my good friends at Dover Coal have done a lot of work here. Uh, my, my good friends at Reed Hildebrand are working on Montague Park right now. Um, you've certainly had the benefit of a lot of talent 
uh, currently and over the years, um, and it is showing. Uh, Fred Coder, who designed that lovely plaza. Sorry, Eric, what's it called? Does everyone hear that? Miller Plaza. Uh, he was a professor of mine at school. A lot of talent has touched Chattanooga, um, and it's great to see. So um, <clears throat> on to making Chattanooga more walkable. I always talk about the walkable city. I give talks about how to do it, why we, uh, sorry, I do talks about why we need it and about how to do it. Um, in talking with Eric, he thought it might be useful for this crowd that probably doesn't need convincing, but might need to convince other folks, um, some of the why we need it. So I'm gonna take you through these three main reasons that actually are the introduction to Walkable City, the big fat introduction to Walkable City, are the lessons that I learned as a city planner, um, someone who with my colleagues and my mentors, Andre Stuani and Elizabeth Plater Zyberg, we were arguing many years for making places more walkable. We didn't use the term that long ago, but you know, just trying to do, trying to convince people that city planning was something that mattered in their communities. And we got a limited uptake, right? As city planners arguing for better city planning in the words of city planning and the philosophy of city planning, um, we only had so much uh, uh, interest and momentum. And a wonderful thing happened, which was about 15 years ago, three different groups, the economists, the environmentalists, and the epidemiologists, essentially started arguing for the same things, but from their own playbooks in ways that caused other people to pay a lot more attention to these issues. And so we've kind of adopted their reasoning, and we share the things that they've taught us. So first, the economic argument, and, and I can only touch the tip of each of these, given the time we have, but the economic argument um, goes a little bit like this. Um, in 1970, we spent 10% of our income on transportation in the United States. Between 1970 and 2010, we basically doubled the number of roads in this country, and what we accomplished is we now spend 20% of our income on transportation. And poor Americans, according to the CDC, are, pay, are spending f as much as 40% of their income on transportation because we've chosen to tie ourselves to the single most expensive way to have a, uh, a nation that has mobility in it. Um, in Switzerland, lovely, wealthy Switzerland, they pay, and, and this number now in the U.S. is $12,000. Um, in Switzerland, they pay half as much per capita uh, to get around, and that's um, you know, a much healthier way to run your economy. That's kind of the negative side. The positive side is something I learned from Chris Leinbricker. Has he ever spoken here? Yeah, yeah he's fantastic. He looked at walk score and um, compared walkable urban districts to what he calls drivable suburban districts. And he looked at the value of housing versus walks. You guys know all, what walks, all know what walk score is? So basically it's a scale of zero to 100, how walkable is your location? And he found, for example, in Detroit, <coughs> there was a 51% premium for walkable urbanism over drivable suburbanism. In Denver, it's 150% premium. In New York City, it's a 200% premium. So the, the house in Greenwich Village per square foot is selling for twice as much, or three times as much, sorry, three times as much as the house in Greenwich, right? So that adds up to about $2,000 per walk score point. Clearly, those people who invest in providing walkability in their cities will make their cities uh, more, more walkable. In terms of office, throughout the last uh, 15 years or so, there's, there's about a, been about a 27% premium for walkable urban office over suburban office, developers understand this, and certainly during the, um, during the, 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 the bubble uh, crunch of 2008, and then subsequently with COVID and the repercussions we're still seeing is that the suburban office is struggling much more than the urban office. And actually some of the suburban office parks don't really have reasons to exist anymore, um, as has been well covered in the New York Times and elsewhere. Malls, of course, are dead or dying. Uh, America's shopping malls are dying a slow, ugly death, or this more recent article from, t from just uh, less than a year ago. Um, of the 700 malls that now exist, I don't know about yours and how well it will do, but um, most of the existing malls are expected to not survive. Um, and I, I have this nice collection of, of dead mall porn that I keep <laughs> by my bed. If I have trouble sleeping, I pull out these pictures and look at them. So that's just part of the economic argument, but, but you get the point. The environmental argument, I think, has become more and more obvious over the years. Uh, I like to tell the story how when I built my house in Washington, D.C., 
I did my best to clear the shelves of the sustainability store. You know, everything I could get, I got the, 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 the bamboo floors and the, the solar hot water heater and the uh, solar, uh, um, solar photovoltaic system, you name it. Uh, the, the, the wood burning stove, according to the catalog, a log in our wood burning stove contributes less to climate change than if it were left to decompose in the forest. All right, so we did all that, but it turns out that all of these things that we did uh, contributed much less to lightening our carbon footprint than the fact that the house sits in a walkable neighborhood three blocks from a transit stop um, in DC. Also in DC, the EPA sponsored this study <clears throat> called Boiling It Down to BTUs, where they compared green and not green houses and green and not green vehicles in walkable and drivable environments, and they found that in a walkable environment, in a walkable neighborhood, the dirtiest house and the dirtiest car contributes less to climate change than the greenest house and the greenest car in a, in a drivable neighborhood. So it's just um, important to understand that that's the biggest part of our footprint. And it took us a long time to get there because for a long time, the climate maps, the carbon maps of the US look like this. In fact, you can still go online and see maps like this where um, you know, they kind of look like the night sky photos of the US. Hottest in the city centers, uh, cooler in the suburbs, coolest in the exurban areas. This is Chicago, and you can see how um, if you measure carbon per square mile, the cities look horrible and the suburbs look better and the countryside looks best. Of course, that was the wrong way to measure carbon. And shortly thereafter, some very smart economists said, hey, why don't we measure carbon not per square mile, but per household? Because there's only so many of us in the country at a given time we can choose to live where we have a lighter footprint or a heavier footprint. Um, and when you measure it per household, the maps just flip. City after city, uh, and Chattanooga as well, this is what you're going to find. The further you get from the downtown, the heavier carbon footprint you're going to have. And then finally, the epidemiological argument. Um, you know, we all know that diet is an issue. We blame Chattanooga in part for that experience. <laughs> but the, um, the, I learned about this today. But the, um, the best day to be a planner in the US, if you were me at least, was August uh, 7th, 2004, when this book came out, Urban Sprawl and Public Health. And it was three epidemiologists telling us that the reason that we had the first generation of Americans, now we're on to the second, but the first generation of Americans who were expected to live shorter lives than their parents was because we had engineered out of existence the useful walk in our communities. You know, it's calories in and it's calories out, and we weren't expending the calories out. One of those epidemiologists gave me this slide, which you may have seen before, <laughs> but the idea that you can drive to park to take the escalator to the gym to get on the treadmill to walk they were saying is the reason why we have a, an unhealthy society. And fully a third of the children born after 2000, maybe that's some of you, um, are expected to become diabetics because of our lack of activity that's been engineered out of the landscape. There was a wonderful accidental study uh, done in Beijing where there's a car purchase lottery. And like in the old days in, in, in Russia, you had to enter a lottery in Beijing to get the right to purchase a car. So they, and it was chosen completely randomly. So they chose the people who won the lottery, they compared them to the people who didn't win the lottery, randomized experiment. People over 50, if you won the lottery and got a car, you gained uh, 22 pounds on average. And if you didn't get a car, your weight stayed the same. Again, that's for people over 50, which is interesting, but um, you get the point. It's, it's clear that the single greatest contributor to our, um, uh, you know, our physical health decline is the fact that we're getting less exercise because we're not driving. And then, of course, the other half of it is the millions of people permanently injured every year, but 40,000 or so killed every year uh, in car crashes. It's very bad for your health to die in a car crash. Uh, but what's interesting is also how it varies per city based on how those cities are designed, when those cities were designed, how much driving you have to do in those cities. So per 100,000 people per year, New York loses four people, San Francisco loses four people, Denver loses seven and a half people, San Antonio loses 12.3. I don't know if I have Orlando. Orlando is like 18. But the point is it's the design of your city that determines um, your car crash deaths. And it's not just the pandemic that has brought our life expectancy down. Most recently, 
Um, this is a fascinating article in The Atlantic just a few months ago. If you're in your 40s, you're roughly six times as likely to die this year than if you're uh, in America than if you're in Switzerland. Six times as much because of both basically diet and car crashes. And so it's no accident that the U.S. is at the top of... The laser doesn't work, but I can actually point at this with my finger. <laughs> It's no accident that you're at the top of this list for obesity rates and at the top of this list for um, car crash deaths. It's all related to our dependency on the automobile. Um, so that's the argument, but I should say, since, work, since writing Walkable City, um, I've had the opportunity to identify or at least call out two other uh, factors that I think are also super interesting when you compare um, walkable areas to not walkable areas. Uh, one is community and the other is equity. And I write about this in my book, Walkable City Rules, but actually in the update that is in this book that you're receiving tonight, I talk as well. Um, famous work done in the 1980s by Donald Appleyard, where he took identical urban streets, but some had heavy traffic on them, and others had lighter traffic on them, in other words, car traffic, and then he compared that to pedestrian traffic and where people uh, uh, walked and how much of their environment they considered their home territory. And here, uh, I'll read a quote from Walkable City Rules, which just summarizes, Appleyard found that most people living on light traffic streets considered their entire street to be their home territory, while most people on heavy traffic streets only felt at home within their own buildings or apartments. More remarkably, while people on light traveled streets counted on average 3.0 friends, people on busy streets averaged only 0.9 friends. That's hardly the best ad copy, Heavy traffic for those times when you want to have slightly less than one friend. <laughs> um, so that's community. And then equity, um, this is a chart of based on different incomes, lowest to highest, uh, how many people walk to work uh, or bike to work. And you can see that the, the poorer you are, the more likely you are to rely on walking. So if you're interested in walking, if you're interested in equity, investments in walking are, are serving those with less. And then to everyone's surprise, fully 38.5% of the people who walk or bike to, to work, sorry, of people who bike to work or school are from the poorest 25% of, poorest 25 of income earners. So people imagine the typical urban cyclist as you know, the mammal, the middle-aged male in Lycra. But in fact, it's more likely a restaurant worker or a hotel worker or someone else who actually doesn't, doesn't have the choice. And then, of course, so that's who relies on walking and who relies on biking. Now, if you look at who's being harmed by the, by the design of our streets and this, this, this um, report that comes out every year from Smart Growth America, Dangerous by Design, um, if you are black or, or Native American, you're about twice as likely to be killed as a pedestrian than if you're white. Um, and if you are a, uh, you know, earning... Uh, in the lowest income bracket, you're about three times as likely to be killed as a pedestrian than if you're earning in the highest income bracket. So there's all these, uh, all these ways that walkability and improving walkability trends to, uh, to support those who have the least. So um, I repeated that. So that's five reasons now, right? Health, wealth, environment, community, and equity to make our cities more walkable. And now we'll move on to how we can do that, and perhaps how we can do, do a better job here in, in Chattanooga. And here I'll have a sip of my transformed water. So I have what I call my general theory of walkability. It's a bit of a tongue-in-cheek phrase, but it's something that we keep refining and trying to um, adjust as we learn new things about what gets people to walk. But essentially, what it boils down to is in America, in which driving is so easy and so cheap, and the car is sitting there in the driveway between you and everything, it's so easy to fall into it. It's heavily subsidized. And the fixed costs are very high, and the um, variable costs are very low. So if you own a big sedan, for example, you are uh, about four-fifths of the cost are fixed, and about one-fifth of the cost are driving, are driving the car. So the smart thing to do if you have a car is to drive it all the time. And every mile costs less than the prior mile for that reason. So in those circumstances, how do you get people to walk? And the answer is 
the walk has to be as good as, a drive, as the drive. And to do that, it has to do four things simultaneously. It has to be useful, it has to be safe, it has to be comfortable, and it has to be interesting. So that's the structure of the body of Walkable City, and it's the structure of my talk tonight. And we're gonna march through each one of these as it pertains to um, the circumstances here. The useful walk, this is a lesson I learned from my mentors, Andres Duani and Elizabeth Plater Zyberg. Andres used to give a talk called The Story of Planning, and he talked about how, you know, in the 19th century, people were, were choking on the soot from the dark satanic mills, and the planners, who weren't yet called planners, said, hey, let's separate the housing from the factories, and they did, and lifespans increased immediately and dramatically, and the planners were hailed as heroes, and we like to say they've been trying to repeat that experience ever since by separating every use from every other use uh, with, with tremendous precision. So, you know, single family housing is separated from multifamily housing, and offices separated from retail, and medical offices separated from general office, et cetera, across the uh, American landscape. All this does is guarantee that you can't have a walkable community because the uses are so big, and typically there's only one road, so it becomes quite noxious, right? Um, so this is the foundation that we now know is wrong. And as wrong as we know that this is, even though we're taught this now in planning school not to do this, most of America is still sitting with maps on it that look like this. And when we show up in a place to work, this is usually what we're met with. So there's a lot to unbundle. Um, I always, you know, I was an art history major, and I always say, um, maybe that wasn't the most lucrative choice of majors, but I can tell you, you don't want a Rothko, you want a Seurat, right? <laughs> Seurat was the pointillist. And the more fine-grained, the more confetti-like, the more mixed up your different uses, this red color in Manhattan actually being vertically mixed use on every lot, the more you mix your uses up in fine grain, the more walkable place is obviously going to be. Which launches me into the primary new urbanist argument. I know Dover Cole, Victor Dover, has done a lot of work in this town. He's one of the early new urbanists, as was I, um, following Andres and Liz's uh, lead. But the classic new urbanist conversation that I still have wherever I go, that Andres doesn't do anymore because he's just sick of it, but I think it's so important, is to explain that there are truly only two tested ways to make communities. And one is the traditional neighborhood, and the other is suburban sprawl. Suburban sprawl is an invention after World War II. The traditional neighborhood was not invented. It evolved naturally alongside mankind. Um, and what you see here in Newburyport, Massachusetts, near where I live now, um, is uh, several neighborhoods, and you see in each neighborhood bigger houses and smaller houses, places to work, places to worship, places to shop. It's hard to see from this close. The main street is, is down in here. Um, most of your daily needs are within walking distance, so it's diverse, at least in use. It's also um, compact. Typical neighborhood is five minutes walk from edge to center, or about a half a mile across. And it's walkable because there's lots of streets that all connect to each other. So no one street needs to be that big, right? If you compare that to sprawl, um, clearly not diverse, right? One use can cover an entire square mile. Um, it's not compact, thus the name sprawl. But also, very few streets actually go anywhere, right? Dead ends and loops. And the only streets that do connect, they're far apart, and they have to serve all the traffic for the entire community, so they're designed just around moving as many cars as possible. We call them traffic sewers, because they serve no other function except to move vehicles. Notice there are no addresses. These are backs. There are no addresses on these streets whatsoever. And of course, um, according to Adam Rune's everything, you're 385% more likely to die as a pedestrian in this environment than in that environment. You know, everyone wants to move to a cul-de-sac for the safety of their kid, but the kid becomes a cul-de-sac kid. He can't leave the cul-de-sac, or he ends up on the deadly traffic sewer. So that's the model. It's fun to break sprawl down into its constituent parts, the places where you only live, where you only work, uh, where you only shop. Schools get bigger and bigger, and their parking lots get bigger yet, because even busing will not serve schools that are uh, you know, the people still are still, school districts are still consolidating schools for the pride of the district or somehow for some efficiency, but they forget that having a school in your neighborhood that you can walk to is so important. When I was young, half of children walked to school, now 13% of American children walk or bike to school. And then, you know, recreational facilities also, 
you know, it's great to have eight baseball diamonds and eight soccer fields and however many basketball courts, but the kid who lives here actually has a mile-long drive to get to the, the field. I'll show you. There it is. <laughs> From the house to the field. Right? And of course, you'd never, make a, you'd never walk or bike like this because it's so incredibly inefficient. So, and, and this is ridiculous, right? You look at this and you say, well, what a crazy thing. How could we do that? But if you begin with the presumption that everyone's driving everywhere, then decisions like this become absolutely natural. And of course, the one part that we forgot to count. If you're going to separate everything from everything else and then reconnect it only with automotive infrastructure, then the highway system, which was created for commerce and for vacation travel, basically becomes a commuting, a commuting system. And I always tell people, you know, depending on the poll that you look at, um, at least 10% of Americans want this, the house with only other houses around which you can't, from which you can't walk to anything else. But just understand that this American dream comes with this nightmare, that you can't have one without the other. Often to absurd extremes, this isn't far, <laughs> this isn't far from where I live in Boston, and, um, you know, the idea is that you can't ever have to wait more than one cycle at a light. Because in this environment, it's so completely soul-crushing and banal that if people have to do that, they will start killing themselves <laughs> by the dozens. So, you know, Walt uh, this is not Photoshop. Walter, Walter Kulash, who worked here many years ago, uh, took this picture. Uh, and it's stressful on families. The longer, the longer your commute, the more likely you are to become divorced. That's a fact. Uh, so driving is no fun. Uh, being a pedestrian can be worse. And that all leads to these two pictures, which if, if you remember nothing else from my talk tonight, then just sear these into your eyeballs. These are the two models. And what's important to understand when you compare sprawl to the traditional neighborhood is that it's the same stuff, places to live, work, shop, recreate, go to school. But how big is it? How far apart is it? And do you have what's called a dendritic or branching street network where every trip is from the local to the collector to the arterial to the highway and back again, a branching street network? Or do you have a, a porous true network, like a grid? It doesn't need to be rectilinear. But do you have a grid or do you have this dendritic system? Because the great irony of sprawl is that it was created for driving, but it's worse for driving. Because if there's one engine fire on this road, the entire city shuts down for an afternoon. Meanwhile, there's 21 ways to get from here to here. So it's just a superior system in so many ways. So <clears throat> you have a heart, you have a downtown, and much of your city, your traditional city, which is organized in that way. And you can be very pleased about that. You have also parts of your city that are organized in the post-war automotive way. It's completely normal. What's remarkable is I first decided to look for the first time from the air, at least in Google, at Chattanooga, is how incredibly perfect your, your, your graph is of zones that take you through the different histories of planning, the downtown, and then clearly with some more trees in it, you have the inner ring suburbs, and then even leafier, you have the outer ring suburbs, then you have your industrial hinterland, which includes the airport, and then finally you have the growth beyond that even, which I'm calling the dystopian hillscape, because <laughs> it's hilly. But it maps out, it maps out remarkably cleanly, and so I think for folks studying cities, this is a very interesting model to consider how each era has taken you to that different, to that different model. Uh, now cities, of course, are refocusing, as you are doing, cities are refocusing downtown. So as we turn downtown, and we now think about this first category, the useful walk, we have to ask the question, what uses in your downtown are missing or underrepresented? And you're doing a lot better than you were, but in most American cities, and still in Chattanooga, the ratio of housing to other things is low. And what you find, when you bring the housing back, of course, is that the, you get a 24-hour city and it starts kicking on all cylinders and just becoming a different kind of place. Jane Jacobs observed, looking at Wall Street in 1960, um, when it was a very different place than it is now, and she said, why 400,000 people are commuting to Wall Street every day? Why is there not a single great restaurant in Wall Street? Why is there not a single great gym on Wall Street? 
And her answer was that it lacked time spread, what she called time spread. Because a great restaurant or a great gym needs a nighttime crowd as well as a lunchtime crowd. And, so, and she said, you can't rely on bringing people downtown. You have to put them there. In other words, people living in the downtown core. And that's what a lot of cities are investing in. They're investing in it. They're, they're, they're limiting taxes when people, and I don't know what you're doing here. I, I, I haven't learned. But um, uh, when people choose to put more housing in the downtown, they encourage that. In Des Moines, they went from 2,500 units to about 10,000 units over about 20 years uh, because they offered a 10-year tax abatement. So no, no new taxes. When you convert this, this building into residential, your taxes don't go up uh, for 10 years and then 10 additional years of tax increment financing on top of that. Um, and that's what accomplished that change in Des Moines. The other parts of the useful walk argument, of course, uh, include transit, because you, know, you can have a perfectly walkable neighborhood without transit, but to have a walkable city, you need good transit, because you need to connect the walkable parts to each other in an effective way, or everyone just buys cars anyway. right? Everyone, everyone wants access to the, all the great parts of their city. And if that can't be accomplished uh, without a car, then folks of means will buy cars. And of course, the city tends to shape itself around people with, of means. So transit is super important. Um, and then, of course, I always tell people to think about bike share, which you were a pioneer in, congratulations, um, to think of bike share as transit. To subsidize it like you subsidize transit, uh, I believe you do. But to understand that it's a really an important part of a proper uh, transportation network. There's more that I could say, but we've made it through the first category. Uh, let's move on to the big kahuna, uh, the safe walk. And this is where we're going to spend most of our time tonight. The last two categories, actually, the comfortable walk and the interesting walk, are very quick. But I'm going to spend a solid chunk of time on making our downtown safe. And I say that because of this incredible epidemic that we're experiencing of pedestrian fatalities, and this chart needs to have a couple more years added to it. Um, you can see we've almost doubled since 20, since 2009, I believe, 83% um, more pedestrian fatalities than, than then. And uh, why? Well, we're driving more. Oh, and by the way, you know, the number of people d dying while driving has slightly dropped, but the percentage of deaths that are pedestrians and cyclists, of course, uh, are such a huge chunk of that. There's a wonderful book. Has anyone read this book by Angie Schmidt? I see a couple hands, Right of Way. I read this book and I sold my SUV. I had an SUV. We wanted to be able to move seven people around, which we did once. And I read Angie Schmidt's book and I sold it and bought a, a, a low station wagon um, for the reasons I'm about to explain. But she cites two main reasons why we have this pedestrian epidemic. The first is what we could call the suburbanization of poverty. The fact that, that now the poor who used to live in the inner city have been forced to the outer ring. The outer ring was designed without the expectation that anyone would ever be walking. And so you have all these people who don't have cars, they can't afford cars, who are living in parts of the city that were, were never meant to be walked in or biked in. That's a big factor. And then the other factor is the SUV and pickup trends which aren't happening in Europe, right? which are kind of isolated to North America, and the fact that you are much more likely, and I forgot to put the actual data up on screen, but you're about four times as likely to die being hit by an SUV than you are being hit by a low hooded uh, sedan or other kind of car. So given these circumstances, which we can't really control, right? we're not going to stop the suburbanization of poverty quickly. Let's hope that we can, but that's, that's, that's a long-term problem that we're going to be living with for a while. And the NHTSA, which is in the pocket of the auto industry, is never going to tell them anything about how to make less profitable cars, and I'm sorry to tell you that. So, um, so what can we do? What we can do is change our streets. And we can change our streets quickly, sometimes in just a few months. And we can change our streets in a way that they have, are much safer for everyone. And we do that by making them designed to the speed which we want the vehicles to drive. There's an incredible mismatch in the US, unparalleled almost anywhere in the world, where we're explicitly forced by law or by conventional uh, street engineering practice 
to actually design streets for, for speeds, the design speed, well above the posted speed. Because there's this crazy idea that somehow forgiveness makes streets safer. That if you make a street with more elbow room and less potential obstacles, people will have a safer street. It's true on a highway. When people set their speeds based on the speed limit, anything you can do to remove potentials for crashes, like making lanes wider, or getting rid of parallel parking, or having monodirectional flow, or having no trees, or having big clear zones, or having big swooping curbs, anything you do that increases elbow room makes the highway safer because the speed is constant. But in cities, the speed is not set by the speed limit sign. It's set by people's perceptions of the environment. And they drive the speed at which they feel comfortable. So you need to engineer city streets or neighborhood streets, places where people live, work, shop, recreate, at the lower end of the scale than at the higher end of the scale. And that's something that American engineering practice is just beginning to learn. And we have huge battles every day of the week convincing people of this truly common sense idea, which is that we should design streets to cause drivers to drive the speed at which we are posting on those streets. So what are the factors that determine whether people are speeding or not? Because that's what it really boils down to. And I should interrupt myself to say, have you heard of this Vision Zero concept? Do you have a Vision Zero plan here? I mean, it started in Europe, but the whole fundamental concept of Vision Zero is just that. And it's really worked in Europe. We're going to design streets so tight that drivers aren't comfortable going above the speed limit. And that's what we're recommending. So what are the factors? The first is block size. This is Portland, Oregon, famously walkable, famously 200-foot blocks. Who knows where this is? This is Salt Lake City, famously unwalkable, famously 600-foot blocks. This is my family, or part of my family, crossing a street in Salt Lake City where they give you flags to wave so you're not plowed down. <laughs> because a 600-foot a, a, a block city is basically a six-lane city. Portland, with a lot of one-laners, actually, um, is, a, is a basically a two-lane city on average. So the, in America, at least, as the blocks get bigger, the streets get bigger, this is a study of 24 different cities in California. And as the average block size doubles, the average non-highway death rate almost quadruples. So a clear ratio of block size to death. Here you are at the same scale as Portland, and you're doing fine. Remember, Portland is about the smallest in the US. So that's Portland. This is your downtown. Um, your blocks are about 300 feet, which on the scale of things is quite, quite good. We say you have good bones. And so the foundation is there. As the individual streets become safer, the foundation is there to be very safe. Of course, you have other parts of town that I already described, the, the mall which looks older and the mall which looks newer, um, which have blocks so big they don't even fit on the slide. It's a different model. It's the bad bones part. That's number one, block size. Number two, of course, is street size. Hopefully no one's walking here, right? But people are walking here. And this, this is a logic that pertains both to highways and to cities, which is the idea that if you are thinking you can reduce your traffic by widening your streets, you are mistaken. And we've been showing this slide or slides like them for a quarter century now. And you think it would become an easy sell, but it's really not an easy sell. Um, most planning in cities is still done via the traffic study. And the traffic study ignores what this chart tells us, which is that you experience congestion when the number of cars on the road are larger than the capacity. And the idea is that if you increase the capacity, you will absorb the congestion, and you will be done. But of course, that doesn't happen. What happens instead is what's called induced traffic. It's all those trips that weren't taken because of the congestion. And it turns out that that's a lot of trips. This is the study that was presented at the Paris School of Economics many years ago. It's very straightforward. <laughs> Actually, I have no idea what this means. But I do know what the conclusion means, which is that all the data show that uh, any new capacity you provide in the street will be 40% taken up immediately, and within four years will be 100% take, taken up by new trips that the capacity has generated. And so we have, we have uh, 
chart after chart of highway expansions and how they reduce traffic temporarily, and you very quickly get back to where you started before. And the reason for this is that in congested systems, the principal constraint to driving is congestion. And if, once you understand that, this constitutes an equilibrium that people are choosing to experience, then you understand how induced demand works. We have all these examples from highway after highway. It happens in downtowns too. 1925, they knew it. Any reasonable increase in street capacity will not reduce the density of traffic for the places made available will be taken by those drivers who may be said to be on the margin of convenience. Uh, I won't get into reading this to you, but basically the gist is the more you pay as a city to, to alleviate congestion by building lanes, essentially what you accomplish is a longer commute. That's what you gain. Now, I tell that story everywhere I go, and then I move on. Because people may understand it, you may understand it, there's a lot of people who aren't in this room who aren't gonna understand it, and intuitively, there's still this feeling, we could just add one more lane, right? So when I work in cities, typically, with the exception of very progressive cities like Boston and San Francisco, typically we don't try and reduce the throughput. What we try to do is find those places that are oversized. And the best example I ever had of that was in Oklahoma City, which in t around 12 years ago, Prevention Magazine, in their best walking cities issue, said that Oklahoma City was the worst city for pedestrians in the entire country. And so the mayor called me in and said, what do we do? Well, there it is. He said, what do we do? And I said, let's do a walkability study. And he said, what's that? And I said, I don't know. Let's figure it out together. <laughs> and we looked at the car counts in the downtown. These numbers are 3,000 and 5,000 and 4,000. If you don't know this already, you will learn tonight that a typical two-lane street without turn lanes, just two simple lanes, can handle 10,000 cars per day. That's accepted by even the most conservative engineers. So we looked at these streets downtown with these car counts, and they were all four to six lanes. And they were all designated in the existing plan to remain four to six lanes. And these were the traffic counts on these four to six lane streets. And I said, you have this tremendous mismatch between capacity and demand, and let's fix that. Let's size the streets to the traffic they're experiencing, or even that they're anticipated to experience as your city grows. And so we did a plan. Coincidentally, Devon Energy was building this 50-story tower in the downtown that was generating $200, $200 million in tax increment. And uh, they said, let's spend all that money rebuilding all of our downtown streets, 40 blocks in the downtown core. They've done about 30 of them since then. And I was the guy who got to design all the curb to curbs. Um, and it was, of course, rejected at first and went through a, a very harrowing experience. But they finally accepted, accepted our plans because the traffic study said that it would work. So a typical street went from this to this. <clears throat> Here it is under construction. This street, four lanes one way, became this two lane two way with a train in the, mi train in the middle. Uh, this street became that. Uh, this is what you do when you have money, <laughs> is you can rebuild your, your streets like this. I always tell cities, um, don't rebuild, restripe. <laughs> like, for the price of rebuilding one block, you can restripe a whole sector of your downtown, um, and you can get almost the same outcomes through just restriping your streets to the right number of lanes. So, um, you, you know, here I am speaking in a place that's, and you're going to see, particularly as it pertains to some of my next items, you're already, you've already done a lot of this. So what I'm doing with you tonight is I'm, I'm identifying what you haven't done yet. But I said to Eric with some frustration, damn it, you guys already know most of what I know. So I do see my main role here tonight is like sharing that knowledge with more people. But you should know that there's already been a lot of, of uh, success here. It's particularly challenging on state routes. And I was taken today to Maine and Holesclaw, which uh, Eric remembers, we didn't check the data, but he vaguely remembers that Main Street has less than 12,000 cars per day, and it's four to five lanes wide. That could easily be a three-laner, you know, two-lane with a center turn lane. I would make it a two-laner, but, but even working with a state that's quite conservative, you could make it a three-lane road. And Holtzclaw is less than 10,000 cars, 
easily a three-laner. By the way, a three-lane road will handle 20,000 cars per day. I have a chart of 20 different road diets where four-laners became three-laners, and they average about 18, 20,000 cars per day. But this could be a two-laner. Um, it may have to be a three-laner. But you can see, when you do that, you get extra space back. You get room for the bike lanes. You get room for parking. You, know, you decide what you want to do. But you, you gain space, and you dramatically increase safety, especially when you get rid of a third and fourth lane. Then you have conditions like this one that Dave Johnson told me about, you know, outside of downtown, beyond the mountain, where you emerge from the tunnel, and everyone's speeding down Brainerd Road, um, and there's already been a plan completed to take this street, which you can see has parking on only one side. You better believe these shops are struggling without parking in front. And one shop had to close because a car ran through it, a restaurant. What was it called? Yeah, so, you know, cars are running into each other, People are dying here, and uh, restaurants are being, you know, bombarded. Um, and there is a plan already completed by uh, your old DOT to add parking to both sides by, by right-sizing the number of lanes. Um, but DOT is sitting on this. And, you know, I was working last week in, in Nashville. Clearly, the, 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 for the state roads, it's a, it's a heavier lift because you are having to deal with the state DOT. But I do hope that working together, the different cities, you know, Memphis, Nashville, you guys, and others, Knoxville, can petition, you know, TDOT together to be a little more, to, to move on some of these challenging roads that should be dieted in this way. The next issue, which <laughs> you, you should, should be honored to know that I'm bringing to, to cities all over the US and that you've been on for many years because of Walter Kulosh who literally 30 years ago taught me this stuff. Um, Malta Kulash spent a lot of time here, and, and you've been acting a long time now to get rid of your multi-lane one-way streets. But this is a national trend that we've been doing now for, for a couple decades. Why are multi-lane one-way streets so dangerous? You know, first of all, there's no opposing traffic to slow cars down. Secondly, there's all this momentum of steel going in the same direction. I think the most important aspect is that you can jockey, that there's, there's another lane, that wherever you're going, there's another lane going the same way, and therefore, maybe you should be in that other lane because you could go faster, and you get into this frame of mind as a different kind of driver, where suddenly you're trying to go as fast as you can. At least I am. You know, when I'm on a multi-lane one way, I'm always trying to be in the faster lane, and I think that's kind of normal, even for walkability advocates. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is Vancouver, Washington. They, they, they tried for many years to bring life back to their main street. You know, this is an economic argument as well. They tried the six Bs of the 80s, the bricks, the berm, the banner, the bandstands, the bollards, and the balloons, to bring their street back. Nothing did it until they went back to two-way traffic, famously written about in Governing Magazine by Alan Ehrenholt, the return of the two-way street. The revenues to the businesses doubled when they made the street a two-way street. This is Cedar Rapids, Iowa, where I was called in. Uh, they had half one-way, half four-lane streets running through their, their center city. Um, we changed the street network from this to this, right? From four-lane one-ways to mostly two-lane two-ways, which allowed us to turn the parking where red is angled from this to this. Ton more parking, which the businesses loved, and it allowed us to turn the bike network from this to that. And we did it just with paint. That's my message for you. Nothing but paint to change these streets to two-way. Um, <clears throat> Louisville, Kentucky has the great data. And I was telling Eric, you guys need to collect data. It's easy enough to do. And the university should perhaps do this study, where you now have the experience of having turned a number of streets uh, back to two-way travel. But I don't believe the data has been collected. In Louisville, Kentucky, when Brook and First were reverted, and second and third were not. On the converted streets, car crashes dropped by almost half, and crime even went down by almost a quarter. And on the unconverted streets, car crashes went up and crime went up. And I bet you you'll find same data here. So you, congratulations. You know, you converted Lindsay to two-way. You converted Houston to two-way. You converted uh, others as well that I won't be showing you. 
Uh, but you still have remaining fifth and sixth and walnut and parts of eighth. And so, whoops, and so, um, you know, my point is that you could um, finish the job. <laughs> and by the way, what a beautiful street, one of the prettiest streets I've visited. Um, next. And here's something you've also barely begun that many cities don't know, which is how over-signaled we are in the U.S. So kind of the, you know, when you're a planner, you hate to have a rubber stamp, but the rubber stamp that we've been bringing to city after city is one way to two-way reversion and getting rid of your signals. And when you make a multi-lane, single-directional system, two-lane, two-way, suddenly you don't need signals anymore. You know, if you have a certain high volume of traffic, yes, you need a signal, but for moderate volumes of traffic, when you don't have multiple lanes going the same direction, intersecting each other, suddenly a four-way stop makes sense. In Philadelphia, they did the, the mother of all studies on four-way stops because they changed the rules. In 1972, 472 signals had to be turned into always stop signs. Collected a ton of data, crashes down by a quarter, severe injury crashes by 63%, Severe pedestrian injury crashes went down 68%. Um, I'm going to keep going. So I always say, you know, this is the good city. This is what it feels like. You know, the bicyclists, the wheelchair users, it's really an ideal intersection because it's, it's a low-speed intersection. On a signalized intersection, people are always speeding up to beat the red. But it's not, it's not just that, right? If you have the green light, that is a, a green light <laughs> to... To, to go at 30 miles an hour, 40 miles an hour through that intersection with the always stop, only the most, most rampant outlaw is going more than five miles an hour, which is a very safe speed as they roll, roll through the intersection. This is my plan for Albuquerque. Did a walk, I did a walkability study there. I identified 17, I believe, signals that could be turned to always stop signs. Um, I'm talking to folks in, in Nashville about maybe doing a similar study there. I would love to do a similar study here. Uh, they accepted 11 of my recommendations. And this now is a screenshot from the TV news. And what happened was that they bagged the signals and they put up the always stop signs and then tons of people complained because people don't like change and so a lot of people complained. So they bagged the signs. <laughs> And they unbagged the signals, and then many more people complained, a lot more, because the drivers realized they were getting faster through the downtown, stopping here, 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 and here, than waiting at one light. And that you actually, and Chuck Marone in his book, Confessions of a Recovering Engineer, which is the next book you should read, Confessions of a Recovering Engineer by Chuck Marone, um, he points out that in most places, replacing signals with stop signs actually gets you through the downtown faster. And so doing an audit where you figure that out is a really uh, great idea because it's so much safer and so much more walkable and livable. And of course, if you're on a bike, you just blow through, and it's fine. <laughs> and you did it at 8th and Chestnut already, and I think it's working quite well, right? I felt very safe walking through that intersection. Next is the width of the lanes themselves. Andre Stuani used to show this slide, and he'd say, the typical road to the typical subdivision in America is now wide enough to allow you to experience the curvature of the earth. <laughs> and he was right. The standards have changed from you know, the 1960s neighborhood, look at the width of the street, to the 1980s neighborhood, same height of airplane. The streets are just a lot wider because of this mission creep. And we know that people go faster in wider lanes. The lane width is a key determinant of driver speed, um, and we work on new neighborhoods where we create the skinniest streets we can. And of course, in a residential neighborhood, you don't even have to separate the lanes. You can have a two-way, in this case, about a 14-foot lane. You can get it down to about 12. This is Ion, which we built outside of Charleston, South Carolina. And the developer was Vince Graham, and he brings this street to conferences, and he quotes this famous philosopher who said, broad is the road that leads to destruction, narrow is the road that leads to life. And it's true. So 
You know, Seattle, even 20 years ago, had a skinny streets program for residential neighborhoods, 12 foot clear for two-way streets in single family or row house neighborhoods. But when we're talking about urban areas, commercial streets, dense areas, NACTO, thank goodness, the, the heir apparent to AASHTO, but the National Association of City Transportation Officials is now promulgating its own standards saying 10 feet is a perfectly reasonable width. And you know, seven feet, we now do eight foot parking lanes, seven and a half, eight foot parking lanes. So this is a skinny parking lane up against a 10 foot lane, two large vehicles. You can see they fit. It's a, it's a width in which you might go a little more slowly, but everything fits on the street. And I was delighted to discover this, not only is it a shared space, your new MLK, not only is it all you know, French drains and, and beautiful pavers and, and no curbs and like a plaza street, so beautifully done, um, but I was thrilled to discover on this state road, literally 30 feet for three lanes. So you can do this here, and you should be able to do it on any street here because you did it on this street, and that's just great. So you have other opportunities, and you tend to have about five extra feet of elbow room in a number of your streets. Georgia is park, drive, drive, park, so it should be about 35 feet wide, and it's 40 feet wide in this location. Walnut Street is drive, drive, park, so it should be about 27, 28 feet wide. It's 33 feet wide. So you can take five feet out of these streets. Houston, around this swoopy curve, one lane is 13 feet, the other is 18 feet. So you have all that extra room. Now you can see you don't have room for two bike lanes. This street you do. In Houston you do, at least around this curve. But in most of these streets you just have five extra feet. So maybe you put in pairs of bike lanes, right? One in one direction in one street, one in the other direction in the adjacent street. Um, but you can see the, the impulse to speed around that corner. Um, and then you have Oak Street by the university which is a properly wide street. It's 35 feet wide. And you notice something very interesting here as I get to my next topic. Where's the center line? Whoever designed this, either by accident or intentionally, was aware of this study in London. And there have been three such studies now that show when you remove the center line from a street, even an arterial street, people drive seven miles an hour slower. And this is the kind of thing that points exactly to the psychology that we need to understand about how drivers behave. That yellow line tells you that if you're on the right side of it, you're not going to hit anything. And so you go seven miles an hour faster. And, and, and that sort of um, you know, understanding that, 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 that environment influences behavior is what the traffic engineers have been fighting for so many years to, to ignore. So we should be removing center lines along with putting in stop signs wherever we can. Parallel parking, an essential barrier of steel that protects the sidewalk from moving vehicles. This is Fort Lauderdale, happy hour. I did a walkability study there. You weren't allowed to go west on Himmershie Boulevard. Sorry, you weren't allowed to park on the, the westbound flank of Himmershie Boulevard um, at, at happy hour. So this is happy hour on the parked side, and this is happy hour on the unparked side because no one wants to be near a curb, sitting or walking or just existing when cars are going 30, 40 miles an hour just off your elbow. Um, the other part of this picture, of course, is the street trees, also super important. Street trees slow cars down, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes dramatically, but the studies show that, um, that actually on a street that has areas with no trees and areas with trees, the drivers go considerably slower when there's trees around. And of course, if you have enough of them, in perspective, they almost form a wall between you, you know, in, in perspective, they do form a wall between you and moving traffic. And this is a Dutch artist's depiction of what a sidewalk feels like without the street trees, without the parked cars. And, um, you know, it's also a question of comfort and the pleasure and the, the, the thermal comfort of the street. This is Broad Street, two blocks of Broad Street. You probably know it quite well. And this experience with its tiny trees versus you know, the large trees just makes a huge difference in, in how you feel, how you drive. Next, and we're getting near the end of this big section, next is vocabulary. I love this article from the Las Vegas Sun. I call it Honesty in Journalism. It says, some say the entrance to city center is not inviting to pedestrians. You think? 
So whenever you have stream form geometric swoopy things, uh, you know, amoebas and, and airplane shapes, anything aerodynamic, um, that communicates a vehicular environment and drivers go faster and pedestrians know it's not really for them. And, and probably the biggest uh, violation is the slip lane. This is Atlanta, uh, which has many slip lanes which they're getting rid of. So this is the same spot before and after. So when I look at your downtown, again, it's, it's, uh, it's Houston at Lindsay, um, this slip lane could be removed tomorrow. Right? This, this block could be squared off, and this could be a more normal intersection. You can see the, the introduction of curvilinear geometrics to a traditional city it makes it feel less pedestrian and more of a driving environment. And then finally, bikes. There aren't many cyclists here for the type of city that it is. Um, I have been advocating, you know, in different ways. You have, to, you, have to meet each, you have to meet each city where it's at, but what's been, what's been fascinating as we advocate for bike lanes is how the technology in a mere 10 years, let alone 20 years, has changed. And, you know, this was the gold standard, and it's still quite good, which is the protected bike lane, where the parked cars have been pulled off the curb. You have this on Broad Street, right? There's a little buffer, and then the bike lane is protected from traffic. This is the one that was built on Prospect Park West in New York City. Tremendous impact. Notice they went from three lanes to two. The number of cyclists tripled. The sidewalk cycling dropped precipitously to almost nothing, of course. Speeding dropped precipitously. But remarkably, oh, and injury crashes were down 63%. Remarkably, the car volume and trip times did not change on this street nor on parallel streets. Basically, people were speeding from red light to red light here, and they were just driving more slowly and just as efficiently, even though one lane went away. This being New York City, of course, there was a five-year drawn-out lawsuit. Eventually, the bike-hating NIMBY trolls grudgingly surrendered to reality. But I like to show this picture in contrast with this picture. This used to be OK. We don't do these anymore. Right? Nobody wants their daughter in the door zone, if they can help it, uh, or in this sort of situation which raises the question of, you know, what is a complete street, <laughs> really? Um, just because it has a bike lane doesn't mean it's a complete street. Um, that's worth investigating. But the main reason, in addition to the door, the dooring, and the great danger of being doored and pushed into traffic and run over, the other reason to protect your bike lanes is that there always seems to be something put in your bike lane otherwise, whether it's the trash can or the dumpster or my Uber driver who never pulls in to the parking lane to pick me up, even though there's ample room to do that, or unloading vans or buses or the police often in the lanes, bikes in the bike lanes. <laughs> um, there's always something in the bike lane. So thank God for the internet, right? Um, so you have on, why am I showing this? I'm not sure why. Uh, you, we, but this is the new standard. And now in Cambridge, in Somerville, in Newton, where I have a project, when we build bike lanes, we pull them out of the street. We put them up on the sidewalk. We try to have a tree strip in between the bike lane and the pedestrian sidewalk. This is, if you're building a new street and not simply restriping, this should be your standard. And we're putting them all over the place as we build. What doesn't work is Sharrows, and I was told today this is in Nashville. I've been showing this all over the world, but this is in Nashville, probably the world's most dangerous Sharrow. Um, but the studies are very clear that Sharrows actually make driving more dangerous, sorry, biking more dangerous, that having a Sharrow in the lane does not make you any safer. And actually, I learned this. I was in Australia, I remember. I learned this. And I went on Twitter and I said, hey, we need a new Shero lane that more accurately depicts how Sharrows work. And this was one person's entry. Um, but the winner from Queen Anne Greenways was the Prero. <laughs> Please don't hit me in the bike lane. Um, and again, you know, the mammal, middle-aged male in Lycra, is not your typical urban cyclist. This is much more typically your urban cyclist. Or this, the hotel worker or restaurant worker who doesn't have a choice we talked about the ratio of who's biking where. And you have a very nice protected bike lane uh, in Broad Street. 
it's quite good, but I think my message to you is that it's frustrating building bike facilities because until your bike network is fairly complete and you can get to most downtown addresses safely on a bike, until then you will not see a major uptick in your bike population. And that's why it's hard to maintain momentum because you can add lanes and add lanes and add lanes. Eventually you will hit a threshold and become a biking city. But you have to have the faith to get there because those cities that have the faith do get there and then they become much healthier and much more attractive cities for people to work and live. And then you have destinations like a university where you should be able to, to bike comfortably back and forth through the downtown from the university. You have this beautiful new Montague Park uh, coming by Reed Hildebrand presented last night um, that's going to become a great destination within the larger downtown that should be a, a, an easy thing uh, to bike to. I know Polk Street is going to have a bikeway along it, but, but we want people to be able to bike to this park, right, and not drive to the park, which is going to be such an amazing resource in your city. All right, we're almost done. I need a break. <laughs> but that's the safe walk. The comfortable walk is the most sophisticated and perhaps the most counterintuitive aspect of this argument. Darn, I forgot to put in my new pictures. I was in Split, Croatia, a month ago. And I'm still showing you this old picture that my friend Galina took. Um, evolutionary biologists tell us that all animals, humans among them, are simultaneously drawn to places that provide prospect and refuge. It's in our bones, we can't help it. We've survived this long because we know to be on the lookout for predators and we know to keep our flanks covered from attack. And if you don't feel covered, your flanks don't feel covered from attack, you don't feel comfortable and you leave the space. So when we make outdoor spaces, be they plazas, squares, or just streets, we want them to feel like outdoor living rooms, which means you need to have this sense of enclosure as well as, ideally, some form of prospect. We new urbanists have been talking about this for 30 years. These drawings are about that old. You know, what's the ideal ratio of height to width? One to one is the Renaissance ideal. Beyond six to one, you don't really feel enclosed anymore. And you, maybe you need trees to help out, right? This is one to six. This is Salzburg. Further north than Boston, no one's complaining. No one's doing shadow studies in Salzburg, because it feels so damn comfortable, this ratio. The opposite of Salzburg, of course, is Houston. This is Houston in the 80s. It looks much better. This particular neighborhood looks much better now. But I keep showing the slide to remind us that it is the surface parking lot that's the principal villain in this struggle for refuge on our streets. And you know, you have your share here on Market Street. You have, for example, this surface parking lot. And when you're in these spaces, you know, trees grow very well and quickly here, and so trees are helping out on a lot of your streets, but still, you can see how the space is, is no longer contained, uh, and it feels not so comfortable compared to your best streets, which, you know, I'm going to start showing this around the world, um, prospect and refuge, and the outdoor living room that those great edges provide. So it's really important to build to edges, and I was I was pleased to hear on my tour that these waterfront parking lots are available for development. I was disappointed to hear that no one's doing it. I know a bunch of guys and gals who would love to put buildings on those parking lots, so I'd like to hear about the process that's causing that not to happen, because it's prime real estate that needs buildings on it. Moreover, when you put a building here, this space, which no one really you know, is going to use unless there's a festival, would have enough of an edge here and here. Unfortunately, this is not the best edge, but at least there's a monument next to it, right? But, but if you, with this edge here and this edge here and more trees, thank you, around the edges, um, this would become a well-shaped a well square and not just a piece of grass. Uh, that's the comfortable walk. And then finally, the interesting walk, um, I talked about how one-to-one -one was the Renaissance ideal for height-to-width ratio. This is one-to-one not the most walkable street. This is in Grand Rapids, a very walkable downtown, but no one wants to walk in Grand Rapids between the second best hotel and the best hotel. Because when one side of the street is an exposed parking deck and the other side is a conference facility 
apparently designed in admiration for the parking deck. <laughs> it's just boring. It's dull. It's dull. It's too horizontal. There's not enough going on. Um, and of course, exposed parking decks are the worst thing to have against the street. Um, mayor Riley in Charleston, mayor for 40 years, taught us it only takes like 20 feet of building to hide 200 feet of parking. Uh, or there's an example like this, the Chi I call it the Chia Pet Garage in Miami <laughs> Beach. The storefronts are maintained against the edge. Um, you have good examples here. You have your own building that hides a parking deck with some housing, uh, which you see happening there. You have a supermarket being built. Do you know about this? You have a supermarket being built, pulled 25 feet back from the street with a blank CMU wall so that housing can go between it and the street. And Eric informs me that the market, what's the name of the market? Well, you heard that, I didn't. Um, that they're thinking about making it their national prototype to put their blank walls behind housing up against the street. It's spectacular. It's such a great solution to do that. Um, and you can see what this looks like from the air, be it supermarket or parking lot. You just have a party wall and then this thin veneer of something, housing, shopping, or something else. Uh, and then you also have bad examples of parking lots that aren't shielded. Again, you have great trees that help, but trees are boring. Trees are great, but if the only thing you have on the sidewalk is trees and parking deck, it's not the best walk through there or I keep coming back to Houston, I'm sorry. Um, and then you have a great parking deck that has, I, I, I think if we were to do this today, you'd want the ceilings to be a little bit higher in these businesses. It's a little bit, the, 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 you, you need to not let the, the ceilings be too low in the ground floor. But this is another model that works great, especially if you have some sort of heroic, brutalist garage sitting on top. Um, so that's everything. Those are the four categories, and you have, to do, you have to do all of them. But we're not the Netherlands. I get that at many of my talks. Um, and I like to end by, uh, although I'm not quite done, I like to end by reminding people that actually the Netherlands in the 1970s, when I went there, um, were not the Netherlands. They were Holland, and they were full of cars. And uh, just like in the US, hundreds of children were dying in traffic, and they had a Stop Der Kindermord, Stop the Child Murder campaign led by mothers, and they decided as a country to take this Vision Zero approach, although they didn't call it that then, to street design. And they went from having about 500 children die in one year to having nine children die a few years later uh, in traffic because they made a choice to go from that to that or to go from that to that or from that to that. Which brings me to Broad Street, <laughs> which isn't the worst street, uh, but it has only 7,000 cars per day on it, and it has five lanes, basically, five or six lanes. And the wonderful study that Dover Cole has done that uh, should be implemented, that the plans are to implement it, uh, that will basically apply to Broad Street two conditions, one of them is more of a promenade street towards the north and then further down what's called a broader sidewalk solution. This is a wonderful design. This will transform your downtown. And I know you're trying to get OPM, other people's money, to pay for it. <laughs> and that's great. That's great. But I just want people to know that if you pay for it yourselves, you will get that money back. You will. So get all the, people from, get all the money from other folks that you can. But this is the sort of smart investment in the same way that a city might choose to invest in a, you know, a stormwater uh, facility or, uh, you know, or, or a police department, for the future success of the city, you might want to invest in the sort of thing that's going to really make your downtown sing. Um, and that includes this, that, this sort of project. And I, I have a final point to make, which is that I tend to focus on downtowns. And the reason I focus on downtowns, or I should say main streets, but the parts of those cities that, that are typically pre-war and almost certainly the heart of your city, if you have a city that's, that's worth a damn, your downtown is the best opportunity for walkability. Because it's got so many of the ingredients already in place. You know, improving a an arterial between the mall and the office park out in the suburbs 
is not going to improve lockability because you, you're not going to have all four items. You might make it safe, but it's still not going to be useful. It's probably not going to be comfortable or interesting. My goal as a planner is to make lockable places. That means you make the investments where they actually have a potential to make, make a difference. And there's a challenge because most public servants, mayors, city managers, city planners, um, and even professional planners like me, um, we feel an obligation to the whole city, right? You want to sprinkle the, the walkability fairy dust kind of evenly throughout the whole community. But the problem is that that's not effective because there are only certain places where it's, it's going to have that kind of impact. Concentration, not dispersion, is the elixir of urbanity. <laughs> and the more you can focus on those places that have the most going for them, that are almost walkable or are somewhat walkable, that's where you're going to have the most impact. The other thing is that, um, you know, I should say, the problems that we sometimes have doing this work in downtowns is that people feel it's unfair to the surrounding neighborhoods. We were doing a charrette in Baton Rouge, and we actually had a sit-in that was staged during the charrette. And they said, you know, downtowns in Baton and at this point, this was in the late 90s, at this, almost nobody lived in downtown. And we were doing a charrette for downtown Baton Rouge. And people from the neighboring, neighbor, neighboring neighborhood showed up and they said, why are you doing a plan for downtown and not our neighborhood when our neighborhood's in such worse shape? And uh, what we told them was, what we heard from Mayor Riley of Charleston is that wherever you live in the city, you actually, you have two homes. You have your home in your neighborhood, but actually the downtown is yours too. The downtown is the only part of the city that really belongs to everyone. Right? And you may have your home and your apartment, and that's your neighborhood, but the downtown also belongs to you. And so investing in the downtown is actually the only place-based way to make an investment in your city that benefits everyone. The other thing is that any person looking at your city, be it a corporation or a college graduate, is you know, trying to decide whether to move there or not. And they have an image in their head of your city. And that image is palpable, and it's powerful, and it's physical. And it's the street life, the streets, the squares, the plazas, the coffee shops, right, and the social life that those places engender. That image is your downtown. It's nowhere else in your city. You know for a fact. You know, this is what shows up when you Google Chattanooga. It's not a picture of some beautiful leafy suburb. It's the heart of your city. And so, the downtown, investments in the downtown can really be the, the rising tide that lifts all, lifts all ships. And if you can have a little bit of great downtown, which you already have, you can have a little bit more, then you can have a really great city. And so I would advocate that you, you start there, that downtown is the place to really focus, at least when it comes to investments for walkability, where walkability is possible, that that's where you, where you begin. So, that's my conclusion. I do want to say uh, very quickly, I was asked to maybe think about what some next steps might be. And the quick, easy things would be a signal to stop sign audit, a lane audit. I've talked about all these things already, right? A lane with audit, and then an asphalt repurposing plan. Right? Those four things together, the three of them really, signals to stop signs is a layup. I forgot to mention center line removal. Let's add that in there, center line removal audit. But then the lane audit and the lane width audit then leads to an asphalt repurposing plan. And that would be a very nice, quick study to embark on immediately. So with that, I will leave you with some resources. You all have the book. I hope you'll, I always tell people, don't read the book. Don't promise me you'll read the book. Promise me you'll start the book. Do you all promise to start the book? <laughs> because it was my job, thank you, it was my job to make it entertaining. And if I failed, then you don't have any obligation to read it. But I think you'll be entertained. If you started, I think you'll read it. For those of you who are doing the work, if you're in the trenches, as a, as a public official, as, a, as even an activist, but if you're actually out there saying, no, this lane should be 10 feet wide, this is the book for you, because it's full of data and charts and graphs and images and examples from other cities that 
will help you fight to get those changes made. And then when you try and teach other people to care about this stuff, if they won't even read, then send them to, send them to TED.com, and I have two talks on, on TED um, that are you know, the easiest 15 minutes way to get engaged into these issues. Finally, um, I teach a two-day course at Harvard every summer or spring. This year, it's May 30th through 31st. I'd love it if some of you would come to Boston, take this class. I know it's not cheap to get to Boston, and Harvard charges a lot of money. But when you're done, you get a piece of paper that makes it look like you went to Harvard. <laughs> so think about that. And uh, thank you so much for your attention. <laughs> I don't know if I want to leave my head up like this, but I will, um, I've been told, is there still time for some Q&A, guys? Anyone who wants to leave, I will not be insulted. Make sure you bring your book with you. Um, I will be signing books after. If any of you want a signature, uh, stick around. But I'm happy to take questions. I think there's some mics going around. We have, we have people circulating with, with mics. Hey, Jeff, I uh, really enjoyed your talk. Can we, uh, bring up, can we bring up the house lights? Thank you. Hey, thanks so much for coming to Chattanooga and speaking. Um, one thing that I've been coming across recently is how some cities are recognizing that uh, parking minimums are kind of a big issue, and cities yeah. like Buffalo are removing those. Is that something you've looked at in your work so that we don't end up with these vast uh, seas of asphalt and parking, especially in downtowns, uh, that you know, detract from the beautification of the city? I'm realizing I left out my entire parking segment from my useful walk conversation. But it is in the book. Um, who here knows about Donald Shoup and the high cost of free parking? This is such an educated crowd. OK. So um, it's very clear. You know, Donald Shoup says, the dean, he's the dean of American parking. He says that uh, the on-site parking requirement is a fertility drug for cars. And he goes on to demonstrate exactly why that's the case. As a result of that, there's been now you know, 20 years of, of shupistas, of people promoting his ideas. And cities like Minneapolis uh, are getting rid of on-site parking requirement, like universally across the city. Other cities are reducing their on-site parking requirements. Now, you should know, back in the 80s or so, most cities eliminated their downtown parking requirements. And I do believe here in Chattanooga as well, there aren't parking minimums in the heart of the downtown. I'm getting a veiled agreement. Um, but the, uh, the, the bottom line is that the first step is to allow the market, the smart step, is to allow the market to determine how much parking uh, is needed on a site. It's preposterous for a city to set an arbitrary minimum, which Shoup demonstrates tend to be uh, very inaccurate anyway, in terms of how many cars are needed. Understanding, and I'm someone who works a lot for developers, that both the developers and the developers' financiers are going to demand a certain amount of parking anyway, and they're going to be smart about it. They're going to do the parking studies. They're going to hire Nelson Nygaard to figure out how the combination of housing and office and shopping and whatever else is on the site pencils out, because they don't want to build any more parking than they need to, right? So we just want the cities to get out of the way of developers making those decisions and uh, not create a false and unnecessary barrier to proper design. That's the basic strategy. Yes? Why don't you stand up and shout? Oh, no, he has the mic. This woman will be next. I drive a transit bus for the local transit agency. My transit can you, bus Can you is, talk a little louder? I drive a transit bus for Carta. It is eight and a half feet wide not including the mirrors. And many, peop many people don't know how to pile or park <laughs> on Market Street. So we're wandering into the next lane. I would just have a caveat for reducing lane sizes. If it's on a bus route, don't forget the buses. Thank you for giving, thank you for winding me up. <laughs> Are you ready? The transit agency, I think it's called DART in Des Moines insists on 10-foot lanes and not 11-foot lanes. 
and they say, we realize that most of our passengers start and end as pedestrians, and we don't want them getting killed, and so we want narrower lanes. However, if you have a true constriction, if you have parked cars on one side of the street, and parked cars on the other side of the street, and two lanes going by each other with buses going this way and buses going that way, that's when you slip into what we do in Boston, which is the 11-foot lane. What I can't stand is on three, four, five-lane streets where you know, cars are shimmying left and right, and, every, you know, and there's no barrier between lanes, is insisting on an 11-foot or 12-foot bus lane because there's actually tons of give in that street. So I'm, 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 as I hope was made evident, I want to see more people taking transit. I want to see transit being effective. I don't want to see, uh, I don't want to see um, near scrapes causing uh, transit uh, service to be less efficient. But I want to be very precise, identify those areas where it is a tight squeeze, and that's where the lanes can get a little bit larger. But in conditions where there isn't a barrier on this side and a barrier on that side, be it parked cars or whatever, then I think we have the opportunity to enforce a 10-foot minimum, or a 10-foot maximum, excuse me, 10-foot minimum and maximum. <laughs> it's, you know, there's a lot of things where, where you have big generic rules where what you instead need is design. For example, 20-foot curb radii. You know what a curb radius, the radius of curvature of a corner radius, of a corner. Like a 20-foot curb radii is made so that fire trucks and buses and other things can make it around a corner. But it doesn't know whether you're turning right, in which case you're tight to the corner, or you're turning left, in which case you're off the corner. It doesn't know whether there's a bulb out that surrounds the parking spaces, right, a curb extension on the corner, in which case you need, a, you need a, more of a swoop, or it's pulled back and there's no curb extension, in which you don't need a swoop. Right, so I always tell fire departments, no, no, no. We're not going to do a 20-foot minimum or 25-foot minimum. We're going to make sure that your template fits in the intersection. We're going to actually design it. We're not going to apply an arbitrary brain-dead minimum. I would say the same thing applies to bus lanes. If the bus is in a tight squeeze, then by all means, you know, the 10 and a half feet, when you count the mirrors, need some extra room. But, but I'm not, uh, what I try to fight against is saying, no, all bus lanes must be 11 or 12 feet. Next. Basically, I just had a clarifying question about the first question um, about the like parking. I was reading the chapter of your book about the the parking specifically, and I liked how you were talking about the housing sharing, like the sharing parking that you were talking about in that chapter. Yeah. But my biggest question is: is that kind of shared parking really? plausible now when you have a lot more work from home or people downtown who are living downtown? And how does building more housing affect that? It does. Dynamic? I mean, the, 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 a lot of things affect it. Uh, COVID, people working from home really impacts it. Um, and what my developer clients do is, is they actually study it. Like, they, the question is, you know, I'm doing this right now. We're, we're converting a pure office park in Carmel, Indiana, with 800,000 square feet of office into a mixed use off. We're turning the parking lots into parking structures, and we're building thousands of units of housing. And they have to live together, which is great for everyone. But the question is that how many of those residential parking spaces will then be available for the office workers, uh, at least in the short term? In the longer term, some of the people who work there are going to choose to live there, and that'll make the picture even rosier. And maybe people will own fewer cars because they have a more you know, effective lifestyle. But the, 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 the professionals every day are rejiggering what that ratio is. Are half the people going to take their cars in the morning? Are three quarters going to leave? Are one quarter going to leave? So the, 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 <clears throat> the, the fact that the landscape is changing just means that you really do need to do a study. But you, can't, you wouldn't arbitrarily say that no one's going to leave, and you wouldn't arbitrarily say that everyone's going to leave, and you do your best to find that number. The other nice thing is you, you, you study as you go. So whenever you're building a larger development, or even a, yeah, any multi-phase development, you might build one parking structure or create one parking opportunity, and then you, you test it as you go, and then as you grow into your next phase, you adjust the size of your parking 
for that next phase so that cumulatively it, it ends up proper. And of course, everyone's saying, I'm not a fan of autonomous vehicles. But my partners who are, are all saying, oh, we won't need parking garages anymore because the cars aren't going to need to park because they'll be part of an autonomous fleet in the future. And every parking deck we build now is going to be thrown away in 20 years. Um, my clients don't believe that, and my clients' bankers don't believe that. <laughs> but it is interesting to consider. The other thing is everyone's saying, as I myself have said, we should build parking decks so that they're convertible to residential. And you can do that, but it's about a 20% premium. And it's hard to find developers who are willing to pay that 20% premium. Do you know that people weigh more than cars? If you're going to turn a parking deck into an apartment, you actually need to have more uh, structure. In addition, in addition, you need chases for plumbing every 20 feet, right? So there's, there's a cost to creating a parking structure which is convertible to housing, um, but some people are paying that. All right. I think, I think that's about one, one more. One more? Okay. Sir? Are you going to be a friendly question? The trick is called leadership. And I'm kind of joking, but places I work like Carmel, Indiana, the mayor told the fire chief that uh, he understood that the fire chief was uncomfortable with some of his narrower streets, but uh, if, if he was all right with it, we wanted to do that anyway. Um, he told his traffic engineers that uh, his traffic engineers initially were quite uncomfortable with some of the radical roundabout type solutions that he was proposing, which if you ever go to Carmel, Indiana, they have 143 roundabouts. I'm not a huge roundabout fan, but they work very well in Carmel because it's a suburban driving community. Um, and he had to fight at first to get those done. But um, it does really help to have a mayor uh, or city councilors who believe in these things. But the, the, what, what we are finding throughout the professions, particularly in engineering, is that the, um, a lot of things which people think are rules really aren't rules. And if an engineer can attest based on his or her understanding of how drivers and pedestrians behave, that they are comfortable with a solution, the guidebooks, every, every AASHTO book has in it a paragraph that says, you know, the engineer is allowed to modify these standards if they have a good understanding as to why. So, it's often about picking the right consultants <laughs> and, picking and, and building the right team. Um, I do have one little anecdote to end with uh, about the yellow line, because the yellow center stripe is in the federal highway guidelines. And if you have a street that has more than 15,000 cars per day, the federal government will not fund that street unless it has a yellow center line in the middle. So what we've been advising our communities is that to paint it, Get your grant, paint it with house paint, <laughs> latex house paint. And two years later, maximum, it's gone. <laughs> and and the, the the, you know, no one checks. <laughs> so it is easier to ask for forgiveness than permission in many cases. That's a good place to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Thank you. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs>